So this evening, uh, funding long-term investment winners, a couple of important uh, caveats up front. We're talking investing. We're talking methodology to identify the stock. The second part of that equation is the, the well, now you've identified it, how do you get that entry? What is, you know, is it cheap? Is it offering value? Uh, things such as discount cash flows, uh, fundamental charts and the like. And, and time is not on us this evening, so we're not touching on that part. We did a presentation around that towards the end of last year. There is a video at just one lap. You can download it there. Um, if you, and I've got the links in, in the presentation later. So looking at a couple of different portfolio, boring. I've got my sort of speculative portfolio at the moment. I've got some Adcock Ingram in there. I've got some uh, Platinum in there. And I'm going to add some Palladium in the next week or two probably into there when we get a bit of weakness either in that space or perhaps some, some currency strength. I then have my trading portfolio where I'm trading derivative products, uh, predominantly index futures. But I also have the bulk of my investment sitting in what I call my long-term portfolio. And I call it till death do us part portfolio. The intention there is to buy quality companies that I hold until one of us dies, me or the company. Hopefully, I die first. I want to live for a very, very long time. I want to buy companies that are massively quality. And that's what we're looking at this evening. How do we spot those companies? How do we find Coca-Cola before it is you know, crazy? How do we find those companies? And it's not necessarily, I mean, the point being is that if we identify Coca-Cola as one of those potential stocks or Woolies or MTN or whoever, is at some point in the future, it will give you an opportunity to buy that quality at a great price. That's called market crashes. A market crash is a wonderful thing. It's basically a sale. You know, when Edgar's has a sale, we queue up to buy stuff. When the JSC has a sale, we go and hide under our beds and which would leave us alone. There's a sale on. What do you do when there's a sale? You buy things. So that's what market crashes do. So talking about a death to us park portfolio, my phrase used to be preponderance of evidence, but I'm preferring the, the impenetrable and irreplaceable. Trying to find companies that have, to Buffett's quote, is, is a moat around them, but, but more than just a moat. A company that you can't just sort of replicate and drop another one in its place. A company that has got built-in defenses as to what it does. And some of those defenses will be brands, some of those defenses will be legislative, and we will touch on those. So focusing on the businesses. Because at the end of the day, that's what we buy. And we get very worked into the numbers, the return on equities, the cash flows, the, the balance sheets, and all of that sort of stuff. And, and that, that's, they're important. But we forget that behind this is a company, a business, a business that is being run by people, a business that has suppliers and customers. And that business ultimately needs to continue having suppliers and customers and continuing to be able to make those return on equities, those cash flows, and all of those bits and pieces. So it's almost the first step in the process. The second step is then to delve to fundamentals and the like. And, and, and anyone who's been to my presentations know that I keep my fundamentals fairly lightweight. I am not a chartered accountant or anything fancy like that. I studied film and video at Natal Tech in the late 80s. Um, when I grow up, I'll be a photographer. So uh, to me, the fundamentals can be done quite simply in that process. <clears throat> What's critical, and, and, and uh, it was uh, Dick Cheney who said, you know, what did he talk about? The known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. And we all laughed at him. But in truth, he's a little bit right. There's, what do we know? And in truth, we know very little. And I don't just mean from an absolute, you know, do we know it to be true? Is that our, our circle of competence is actually relatively small. And it's not dissing anyone. It's the same for all of us. We, we think we're experts at hundreds of things. In truth, we're experts at very, very little. And it, it's being comfortable with what we don't know. And, and we, 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 you know, we try and push those boundaries. And we try and say, hey, we can be an expert on... And the answer is, no, you probably can't. You could become if you really, really wanted to. And, and uh, Alec Hogg, who was here on Tuesday, was talking about his, his, his trip to Berkshire Hathaway and how Warren Buffett talks about the three boxes. And the one box is the companies he knows he likes. And there's very few companies in that box. The other box is the companies he knows he doesn't like. And there's very few companies in that box. The third box is the companies he just doesn't, he's just not sure about. And that's where the bulk is. 
And far too often, that's where we go to invest. We go to the ones we're actually just not 100% sure about. In fact, we should go to the box, which has the companies, which we are confident of. It's a very small list. Now, my death just part portfolio is maybe eight or nine shares. That's it. And, and in, in, in the 20 plus years I've been running that portfolio, I have sold four. Sold SAB Miller, terrible mistake. Uh, Nedbank, brilliant move. Pick and pay, Anglo-American, both brilliant sales. So one mess up, three good ones. And you're going to make mistakes. That, that just comes with the turf. The critical point is risk I can price, uncertainty I can't. We miss, we, 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 as human beings, we're terrible about assessing risk. We misunderstand risk. We don't get risk. We don't comprehend it. We don't fully understand the distinction between probability and possibility. Possibility is, yeah, I mean, possibility. Possibility of an asteroid landing on this, on, 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 on is, it, is it possible for an asteroid to smack into this hotel this evening? It's possible. Is it probable? Nope, ain't no one betting on it. There's no point in betting on it, because if you're right, you're right, you win the bet and you lose the war. And we mix those two up. Risk is business. If you want to make a buck, you've got to risk. That's, that's what business is about. And certainty is, we don't know. It's a risk we can manage, risk we can calculate. And certainty is, as Dick Cheney said, that unknown unknowns. And that, to a large degree, is that middle box, which has got lots of companies in it, which we're just uncertain about. The best thing to do about those companies is either become certain, or if you don't, just leave them alone. Just leave them to sit in their box. So it's about process. And it is investing, as many things. And, and you know, the, the, the fancy phrase these days is workflow. What's your workflow? I take a photograph, and there's a workflow for it. And I record a video, and there's a workflow. But it's about process. <clears throat> and investing is a process too. And when I talk to fund managers, and I've been doing interviews, a series of interviews for a book which will be out sometime before Christmas, and I don't know which Christmas I'm referring to. <laughs> when I chat with the fund managers and, and people who I have huge respect for, people like Hello Giosi of First Avenue, people like Jean-Pierre Fester of 361, people like Adrian Saville from Canon Asset Managers who started down the road here, and up the road in, in, at University of, of KZN. Um, when you chat to them, the key first point is always that process. And their processes will all be different but it's the rigidity of that process. Because if you've got a strong process that you're rigid about, what does it mean it's repeatable? If you don't have a process, if you bought a stock that went up 100% in six weeks and everything's wonderful, but you didn't have a process, how do you repeat that? I mean, simply, you can't. So it's about having processes and, and, and taking it to the extremes, documenting them, um, writing them down, che checking yourself against the processes. So when I'm investigating a company for the first time, there's an Excel spreadsheet I open, and I go through line by line every bit in that so that I don't skip anything out, so I don't take shortcuts or forget something or add something in which I consider irrelevant. So it's that system for deciding what goes in which box. Is it the I like it, I don't like it, or I simply don't know? It's about managing that part of it. It's the system for deciding what is the value. You've identified the company. You've decided that this company is a great company to buy. Now, how do you decide what price you buy it at? Because the price you buy it at is critical. So that is, is part of that process. And, and there's, there's uh, links there. You can certainly find it. It's a link to, to videos on Just One Lap, which talks about that and, and refers to it. Your portfolio structure. As I do the core satellite. As I said, a whole bunch of ETFs, a couple of, of, of death dust parts, and then some derivative trading on the side. How do you structure that portfolio? And what you don't want, there was a, a chap, I was in Cape Town last night, um, and he, he's got a portfolio, he says, and he says to me, it's fairly diverse. It's got five stocks in it, four of them are platinum miners. No, man, that's not diverse. You are a platinum bull. Now, look, I'll be honest. Five years ago, it would have been five stocks, four gold miners. At least it's platinum miners and not gold miners. I give him that. But he, because he's got five, he thinks he's diverse. And what you want to be is diverse across sectors. And a quick point, and I'm going to come back to it later, but I'll touch on it now. So I have a very simple rule about winning sectors. I'm not interested in the losers. Forget the losers. You know what? Losers typically remain losers, and winners typically remain winners. 
That's just somehow how it is. So I want to buy the winning sectors and I want to buy the winning stocks in it. And I won't ever buy more than two stocks in a sector. Because if I can't decide which are the two winners, it means I'm not, I haven't got a process and I, I move on. So like in the banking sector, I have Standard Bank and Capitech. Those are my two financial stocks. That's it. I wanted to buy a SASFIN. And I should have because it was 30 bucks and now it's 45 bucks. But I couldn't because my process says you're allowed two stocks in a sector. Pick. And my thought was, well, I'll sell Standard Bank, but currently it's going up. So I'll wait for Standard Bank to go up. Then I'll sell it. I'll buy Sasfin. And unfortunately, sasfin has gone up already and the boat has sailed and it's no longer offering the value it was. It was trading at 1.1 times book, which even for Sasfin is crazy. Sasfin should be trading at 1.7 times book. And it probably is now. So never more than two stocks in a space. And in truth, that's a little bit lazy. Head on the block, buy a stock. What is the stock in the space? And if you look at, let's go back to Warren Buffett. If you look at his portfolio, yeah, he's got one rail company. He's got one energy company. He's got two insurance companies, but one is a reinsurer and one is a retail insurance. So we could call those separate. Like the sector, find the dominant winner in that sector. <clears throat> so, key focus this evening, and look at Porter's Five Forces. Porter wrote a book back in the 80s. It's actually a, a management textbook, a strategy work on how to strategize with, with, within businesses and the like. But I quite like it, and I've, I've done a whole bunch of work with Gela Giosi from First Avenue. He uses it a lot around using those five forces within the process of identifying that company. Threat of new entrants, do you have a moat in an essence? Threat of substitutes, and sometimes those substitutes come from left field. There was a company in the 80s, uh, and I, what was their name? I think it was Awa or something like that. They used to make telephone answering machines. The young kids in this room have no idea what I'm talking about. It was a big thing with a tape in it. Okay, they don't know what a tape is either. It had a red blinking light. You understand the red blinking light. Someone would phone and it would literally on a tape record the message and they owned this market. Globally, they owned the market. They were doing in the 80s, they were doing revenue of, of close to a billion dollars. And now they don't exist. Because who has an answering machine? All of us. But where is it? Not a clue. It's in the cloud. Your mobile's got an answering machine. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't even sit on your mobile phone. It's sitting in a, in, a, in, a, in a data storage center somewhere. Your telecom line, if you so wish, has an answering machine. And I remember when, when cell phones came out. I got my first cell phone, in fact, this month, 20 years ago. And they used to charge you 60 cents to, get an, to, to retrieve a message off your, off, your, off your service. And then they zero rated it. So there was a business that was dominant. And you would have said threat of substitutes. You would have said, well, what's the threat of substitute for an answering machine? Nothing. Oh, it turned out technology killed you. And that's going to happen. You're going to get blindsided sometimes. It's absolutely going to happen. Bargaining power of customers. And that depends who your customers are. It depends what your business is. If you're Coca-Cola, we're your customer. If you are, are a, a mining company, you're, you're, if you're Kumba Iron Ore, your customer is, is, is uh, the, 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 the smelters, the steel smelters in China. And what is the bargaining power they have? How much can they pull back from you? Bargaining power of suppliers, the people who sell into you. And then intensity of, 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 of the industry. And oddly enough, <coughs> highly competitive industries are brilliant because other companies are too scared to come into them. A lazy industry, a very uncompetitive industry, probably has nice high profit margins, probably got lazy in what they do, kind of got comfortable in their space. And trust me, some competitor is going to look at that, or some, someone outside the industry is going to look at that and say, this lack of competition makes it attractive to me. It's why the cola walls are a brilliant thing. What do the cola walls do? Broadly, they keep people out of it. And then folks like Richard Branson try virgin cola. In fact, because there are two colas in the world, Coke, Pepsi. In truth, there's one, Coke. Yeah, Pepsi are number two. And it's not a bad number two, but Coke owned that market. End of story. So the more competitive the space is, the better it is for the companies who dominate 
those spaces. And then legislative risk, which is something I've, it's not part of Porter's Five Forces, but I think it is humongously important. And sometimes legislative risk works in your favor, and sometimes legislative risk works against you. I, I'm a huge fan on healthcare. I said up front, people are living longer. People are, planet Earth is richer than it used to be. We have more people in the middle class going to hospitals. We've got a lot more fancy elective surgery. Things which you just couldn't do 20 years ago are now absolutely commonplace. But there's a massive problem in the health industry. Governments around the world look at health and say it's a human right. Access to health care is a basic human right. I agree with that. Governments then say, hang on, if this is a basic human right, how come you're charging so much and making so much profit on this human right? So what are governments going to do? Move in and legislate. We've seen it already. Single exit pricing in the pharmaceutical space. We've seen it in ARVs. The pharma companies were charging uh, ARV treatment for, from farmers, and I don't know the exact numbers, but it was about 1,500 rand a month. Now I think it's 7 rand 50. Four rand. Basically, the government said to the farmers, you've got a choice. Either you cut your price or we'll go make it somewhere else. And you know what? Your patents be damned. So how do we, I mean, in, in that sense then, I, I've just written a column. In fact, I think it is in today's Fin Week. Because I think healthcare is critically important. How do we do it? We stay away from the... Because those are the easy ones to regulate and they've got very little wiggle room. And you go for the drug manufacturers. Because you know what? So those companies are now selling their ARVs for four rand per user per month instead of 1,500. Firstly, they still make profit on four rand. Yeah, the R&D, but they make profit on four rand. But then they've got Viagra and, and Grandpa Headache Powder and all of that sort of thing. So yes, the government will legislate in some places, but not the others. It's not going to legislate in the elective, so to speak. It is going to legislate in the in the in the the, the, the human rights space, the, the the hardcore healthcare. So it's figuring it around it like that. So let's delve into details. It's that threat of new entrants, that investment moat. What is it? What what is it that prevents other companies breaching your moat? A picture of a moat. It can be brand. It can be product. Product is dangerous. It might be patents. Patents, patent law is completely broken these days, but it's broken in favor of the owners of the patents. So it's understanding what does a business do that is absolutely their moat that keeps people at bay. What is it about Coca-Cola? And I remember when Pepsi launched in South Africa, and I remember being with my sister. My sister would never drink a carbonated drink. That, that to her is evil, unhealthy, and bad for you. But we're walking into some petrol station here in Durban, and there's a huge display of Pepsis, and they're selling Pepsis at, I forget the price, two rand a tin. I go to the back of the store, and I buy a Coke, and I pay three rand. And I just like, hoy, man, what, you're off your head. You walked further, you paid more, and it's the same thing. I said, no, sweetie, this is Coke. That is not Coke. Is it the taste? I'll tell you it is. Blind taste test, would I pass? I wouldn't bet on it. It's brand. It's brand. Brand is massive. Woolies. There's a lot of things to say about Woolies that is hugely positive. One of the biggest things is brand, aspiration. People want to shop at Woolies. I shop at Woolies because it's crazy convenient. Apart from anything else, where I live in Johannesburg, I have five Woolies within six minutes of me from small ones to giant ones. I'm super lazy. I always just go to the close one. But I like the convenience of it. I like their food. I, the fact that they, you know, that, that, that steak I get at Woolies is pretty much the same steak I get at Checkers with one difference. The Woolies has three times more wrapping around it and an extra 20 bucks a kg. I know that. I know it's more expensive. Man, I shop there. What do they do? They play to it. So I'm gluten intolerant. So if I have gluten, I mean, I'm not... Allergic, I'm intolerant. If I have gluten, I need to nap. Napping's not a bad thing, so it's not the end of the world. I go to Woolies, I buy their gluten-free pasta. I pay 45 rand 
for 125 grams, whereas you can pay 20 rand for double the quantity of normal pasta. What do I do? I pay it. I extol their virtues. I say how wonderful it is. They've got gluten-free bread, which I just buy a gluten-free bread. The other day I saw the price. 38 rand. I'm too scared to check the weight because I know it's probably like 400 grams. I don't know what a loaf of brown bread costs, but it's probably 10 bucks. And so I have to nap afterwards, really. Brand. So yes, this is brilliant. My best story ever. My, my, my wife buys a, a lamb's wool jersey from Woolies in Peter Maritzburg. A year later, she wants to wash it. She reads the label. It says, hand wash, do not machine wash. She puts it in the machine. She washes it. It gets destroyed. She goes back to Woolies. She said, it said I shouldn't machine wash it. And I now did machine wash it. And it is broken. And Woolies said, would you like the same color when we replace it? They swapped it. Why? Man, because she goes back to Woolies. That is a moat. Can someone replicate that? Yes. But how long to get that into the conscious of South African shoppers? Decades. Generations. I was brought up with... <laughs> um, was it still Woolies? No, it was Woolworths, I suppose. Princess... Was, I, I'm, I'm thinking it was, it, it, it was, it, it was, yeah, it was, it was their house brand. And you just knew that the princess, whether it was your underwear or your socks or your t-shirt, you just knew that this was the best stuff. And I mean, I was six and I knew this. 38 years later, I remember it. Does someone compete with that? Not by Christmas. Not by any Christmas in this decade. That is a moat. That is a crazy moat. Other moats, I mean, the, the cell phone operators, what is their moat? Well, their moat is quite simple. They dominate the market. We've got two guys who dominate. The other two lose money. Celsi and, 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 and uh, Telcom Mobile, ETA, lose money. The problem with Celsi is they started a price war. You can't win on a price war if you're the small guy. Why? Because the big guy just undercuts you. You know why? Because he's got bigger pockets. <clears throat> price is the worst thing in the world to compete on because it's not an edge you sell baked beans, I sell baked beans you drop your price on baked beans man, I drop your price, eventually we both hit zero and we're giving them away, the customers love us but we're not making money Woolies goes to the other extreme, Woolies says yeah, yeah, we compete on price, high price ha <laughs> ha, brilliant love it so what is that moat? that moat might be in the platinum space, the boat is that South Africa owns 70% of the world's platinum is under South African soil. Now, there's other issues about miners, and I'll touch on those. But what is it that is their defendable moat? In the banking space, in part, legislation. You want to open a bank, you've got to buy zero chance. First, the Reserve Bank is going to say, not a problem, bring me a billion rand unencumbered, and then we'll have a meeting. So there's licenses, there's regulations, there's all of that coming up. And then, have you ever tried to change a bank account? I know, FMB made it easy. Man, if that was easy, please save me from hard. I've still got debit orders going off the wrong bank accounts. So different industries are going to have those different modes. What are those modes? What is it that keeps the competition at bay? The Technology as a moat is a terrible thing. Because we don't know what the new technology is. <clears throat> I mean, look at a company like, and look at Apple. Ten years ago, bankrupt, now the biggest company in the world. Look at Google, they were a search company. Ten years ago, they list their search company. It's like, search? You're kidding. Now they're an advertising company. In ten years' time, what is Google going to be? I have no idea. They're making self-driving cars. They might be a car manufacturer for all we know. How do you have any sort of certainty of earnings, profitability, anything on a company which is changing partly by its own DNA, but partly because if you stand still in that space, you just die? And the closest I get to owning tech companies is, is the mobile guys. So what can look like a great moat, a brilliant piece of tech or something like that, and if we go to the mobile phone manufacturers, 
I mean, look what happened to, to uh, Motorola to a lesser degree, Nokia to a lesser degree, and BlackBerry completely. Ten years ago, I was in New York, and you couldn't move without seeing Blackberries, and you only saw Blackberries. There was nothing else. They used to call them Crackberries. There was nothing else in America that an executive had. Every single executive had a Blackberry. Now when they have a Blackberry, you don't know because they don't take it out of their pocket because they are embarrassed by the fact. But here's a top tip. If your headquarter is in a street called Waterloo Lane, you probably won't want to start your business there. Blackberry's headquarters is in Canada, Waterloo Lane. No, no. Come on, guys. Read your history, not Waterloo. So what is your investment mode? What is your threat of substitutes? <clears throat> and threat of substitutes might just be in the mobile space. Your threat of substitute is quite simple. So I buy Nexus 5 from Google, unlocked phone, $350, ship it to South Africa. I go contra uh, off contract. I'm a pay-as-you-go user. And I've been on every one of the four networks in the last six months. I started an MTN. I went to sell C because they had good prices. That's meaningless if you can never get a, make a phone call. So I moved from Sol C, went to ATOP because they had high speed. Meaningless if you can never get a signal. So I went to Vodacom. They were just terrible at every level. So I went back to MTN. Number portability. I'm back at MTN. I've been through the whole ground of them. I think I started almost a year now. I started in August of last year. So there my thread of substitute is ease of swapping. Number portability works. I've now ported five times, and it's worked perfectly every time. And I, I do know some people who've had horror stories. There's always a horror story. But that number portability is massively easy. But beyond that, so, but what is my step further from, from that? Forget the fact that I can move between con uh, different uh, mobile uh, suppliers. What threatens the idea of moving voice and data through the air. I, to be honest, I have no idea. And, 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 and 30 years ago, when we used bits of copper in the ground, and you told me we were going to put it through the air, I would have laughed at you. I mean, is there something that will come along? I don't know. I, I, and if I did know, I wouldn't be here. I'd be beavering away and designing it and selling it to Google or Apple or somebody like that. The issue that those folks have the threat of substitution for them, for the telcos, is internal. We stop making voice calls, we make VoIP calls. We stop using SMS, we use WhatsApp. So they've got to adjust in that space to keep their businesses going. And ultimately, to my mind, they become utilities. Like water and electricity providers, they sell data. And they sell tons of it, very cheap, small margin and it becomes broadly ubiquitous. And then what do you want? You want the guy who sells the most data at the best margin. And I'll touch on that in more detail. So it's competition. Yep, it's innovation. And innovation is scary because we don't know where innovation is coming from. In some places, like food, there hasn't really been innovation. I mean, yes, I know we've got uh, fries who can make meat. That, that's innovative. It's fertilizer and water. He harvests, he sends to someone who turns it into food, he sends it to someone who sells it to you. In that chain, I like the person who sells it to you because they've got the best place to make margin. Farming, tough job. What happens if there's no rain? And you are just messed. The folks in manufacturing, really tough space, massively competitive. And your brands aren't strong enough. Uh, those ginger biscuits, what are, I think they're just called ginger biscuits from Tiger Brands. Ten years ago, you wanted a ginger biscuit, you bought Tiger Brands ginger biscuits. Now you go into a shop right, you can buy the Tiger Brands ginger biscuit, you can buy the shop right ginger biscuit for 20% cheaper, and there's two or three other competitors. My unsophisticated padded, looks at them and says, yeah, they're all biscuits, man. So I buy the ShopRite one. A, it's cheaper, B, I'm a shareholder, more profit for ShopRite, better for my pocket. So what can come and disrupt? And what you really want, and that's why I don't like tech companies, because 
I mean, innovation, competition, ease of swapping, these things are, are, are there and we can't see them coming. If you Coca-Cola, ease cost of swapping, my ability to drink Pepsi, zero friction. Except that I've never, I mean, to this day, I've never drunk Pepsi. Can't see the point. I drink Coke. It's so my drink of choice. Oh, not my drink of choice, it's my carbonated drink of choice. Drink of choice would be red wine. <laughs> Closely followed by whiskey and beer. Not all in the same glass. <laughs> uh, is Coke going to have competition? Yeah, they've tried. Virgin Cola all over the place. Um, locally, Bola Metcalf has got Jive, uh, their, their quality beverages, Jive. Hashing, Hashing Amla is, is, is the, the brand ambassador. It's not working, just not happening. Can't get traction. I tried price wars, tried everything, not there. Um, innovation, I mean, probably the only innovation you ever saw in, 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 the, in the beverage space was when Coke tried to innovate and change the formula, and that didn't work terribly well. They went hurriedly back to their old, to their old formula again. The key thing is boring. Boring is lacquer. Boring is a good space to be in simply because of lack of innovation, lack of, 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 of that. So, substitutes, bargaining power of customers. It depends who you are. If you are a mining company, it's not that your customers have bargaining power, it's that the customer decides how much they will pay you for your commodity. You are a price taker. That is quantifiably the worst thing in the world to be. You make something, and you go to your customer and say, I made this, how much will you pay me for it? Regardless of your cost of input, you accept what they say. So it costs you 20 bucks to make a widget, customer says, I'll give you 10, and your answer is, well, thank you for 10. That is not a powerful place to be. And it's why the, I, 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 single commodity mining stocks, I will not invest long term. I will own them when the commodity is booming. And at the moment, there's no commodity. But you don't want to be in that space. You don't want to be the price taker. You bargaining power of customers. Woolies. What is my bargaining power at Woolies? Zero. I mean, I, I, I can walk out. I can leave. Yes. Yeah, that's I can leave. That's my, that's my bargaining power. But I certainly don't go to the till and say, hey, whew, man, 160 bucks for like, you know, 200 grams of salmon. I, I want to pay 140. They're going to say you can leave. Bargaining power at the telco? Zero. But I can just move. I can just swap. And it's a different folks. Again, so if, you, if you're looking at... Let's uh, jump to the, to the banks. My bargaining power at a bank is my ability to move. The problem is my ability to move from one bank to another is exceedingly difficult. And ultimately, if you keep on bank hopping, I've been mobile hopping. My implication to me is zero. You start bank hopping, somewhere there's a credit bureau person who says, four banks in one year, you're, you're an E. I don't know what an E means, but an E must be bad. So it's that ease and the alternative to it and how much pressure they can put on you. And, and it, again, it, it depends on the industries. In the manufacturing space, if you make a widget, does someone else make a widget? Is your widget better or cheaper? Because if that's your edge but someone else makes it, that's no fun either. You look at companies like Kudeco. They supply 225,000 different parts into the farming space. When I say parts, I mean bolts for a tractor and, and you know, carburetor caps and stuff. 225,000. Your ability to substitute is there, yes. But what have they got? They've got quality. But more than anything else, they have 225,000 parts in stock. So if you've got a bearing man, whatever bearing man makes, and you need a whatever to make your bearing man bear, and you walk into their saying, I need this piece. They'll say, cool, one or two. And they've got the stock. Do you move from that? No. 
Because if you are a, a, a mining company or whatever it is, that piece of equipment you need the spare part for is a critical piece of equipment. Your factory is not operating while that happens. And then it bargaining power <coughs> of suppliers. The folks who are supplying to you. Let's look at mining. Who are your suppliers in mining? Well, it's ESCOM. And when they phone you and say, turn your lights out, you've got two choices. You turn it off yourself or they turn it off for you. We could argue almost to a degree that labor is a supplier into, into the mining industry. And witness the platinum strike. I mean, the rights and wrongs aside, we can see where the power is at this point in time. And that power will shift. But the last thing you want is power that shifts. You want to know it's quantifiably there and it is fixed. Because if one day it's here and one day it's over there, what do you have? Uncertainty. And you can't do zip with that. Woolies, bargaining power of the suppliers to Woolies, zero. Woolies wants your... So I, I had a friend who... who uh, he wanted to supply some stuff to Willie. So he phones them up and eventually after like eight months of emails and phone calls, he gets a meeting. And he goes into the meeting and he's all excited and, he, and, and, and Willie's basically says to him, cool, we like the product, but we want these changes and this is how much you must supply it at and this is where it must be supplied and this is how we will pay you. And he said, but if I do it at that price, I don't make money. Willie said, well, Dad, hold on, that's not the question. The question is yes or no. And he said, no, left. Willies are like, that's not a problem. We'll find someone else who does something similar or different or whatever. They've got absolute power. And then they pay you at 120 days. I mean, the best trick from the big retailers, Willies, but to a bigger degree, your checkers and your shop right. They get that tin of baked beans. They typically sell it within 10 days of receiving it, but they pay for it after 180 days. Sometimes 120 so they've got the cash, and they sit on that cash, because you, you've paid cash. I mean, you might have paid credit card, but they've got the cash on day one. And they only pay for it 110 days later. And, and you approach them and say, can we have better terms? And they're like, mm, nah. I tried to launch a magazine once, and, and in those days, RNA was the only distributor of magazines in South Africa. And it was quite simple. They told you how many they want you to print, they reserved the right to return 100% of the magazines and they would pay you at 180 days. And I'm like, which part of this works for me? And they're like, oh, we don't actually care. You want to get your magazine on a shelf? You talk to us. So I didn't do a magazine. Some industries obviously have a heck lot. Sometimes your supplier has the power. Maybe you need, I mean, let's go back to the telcos, the, the, the mobile operators. The suppliers have no power. And the suppliers broadly are either the folks make, making telephone masts, the cell phone towers, the people making the handsets. Maybe we could say that ICASA is one of their suppliers, providing access to, to, to bandwidth and airwaves, etc. And ICASA does have the power. They have absolute legislative power in that space there. But if you're just making screwdrivers, And your input is steel. Yeah, you can shop around. Nice and simple. But if you're making this amazing little thing that needs a little fancy piece of widget to make it all work, and that's the oak who makes it, that oak is a huge risk to your business. Because maybe he goes on holiday. Maybe he stops making it. Maybe he says to you, ha-ha, price went up. And that is exactly that one there. Intensity of the competition. The cost to get in and the likelihood of making a profit from it. The more competitive a space, the better it actually is, if you've got the winner. I mean, in a competitive market, you do not want to be even number two. I mean, Pepsi's fine, but no, you want to be Coke. In an uncompetitive market, you just don't want to be there, because someone's going to look at this uncompetitive market and say, hey, hey, let's get a slice of that action. Let's come in and, and play in that space. And, and, and sometimes, I mean, we've seen it, I mean, SAB Miller, case an example. Hugely uncompetitive market. SAB Miller, let me go back 20 years, lazy company. But their edge was their distribution network. They could get their beer 
whether you liked it or not, to every hotel, every shabine, every bar, every bottle store, every restaurant. I mean, have you ever walked into a bar and heard, sorry, no castle? No. You might, they might not have Heineken, they might not have Johnny Walker, they might, but they've got castle. So folks saw that and thought, oh, lazy industry, Louis Late, others have tried it, Mitchell's from Neisner, who made a far superior beer. But the edge they had, their moat, was a fleet of trucks. And competitive industries keep people away. Why do you want to spend a billion rand to enter a competitive industry where you A, might fail, and B, you might get a bad return on your billion rand? So the status quo remains. So your winner remains the winner. And your losers stay where they are. And not always. Things change. Pick and pay. Used to be the winner. Now it's shop right. Will pick and pay ever get back to being the winner? I don't think so. I mean, they could, yes. But as a shareholder of ShopRite, I hope not. A couple of points to watch out for. I'm going to start at the bottom. Lack of earnings visibility. Typically, we, we, we don't really worry about this much. We say, ah, oh, they make money. But the question is to ask yourself, so how are they going to make money in five years' time? And how are they going to make money in ten years? or 15. And as you go further out, your likelihood of being right is significantly reduced. But there are some companies we can look at, Coca-Cola, how are you going to make money in 15 years time? Man, they're going to make money by selling Coca-Cola. Google, how are they going to make money in 15 years time? Well, I haven't got a clue. That's uncertainty. MTN, how are they going to make money in 15 years time? They're going to make it from data. Not voice. They're going to make it from data. But they're going to make it from what they add on top of the data. So MTN will offer you streaming movies, music. And I'm surprised that they haven't moved more aggressively into that space. I think I know what the problem is, is that our bandwidth is still too expensive. They need the bandwidth to come down in price before they can really offer those services. And they really don't want to move the, band, the bandwidth prices down. That will happen by, by uh, they're going to go there kicking and screaming but they will go there in time. And when it hits at equilibrium, they're going to say, well, if you're only going to pay me two cents per gigabyte, well, I'm going to sell you a movie that's 10 gigabytes. Boom, your bandwidth usage goes through the ceiling. So how do we see that? And if, 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 what, if, we, if we're saying in 10 or 15 years' time, we don't know how they're going to earn, or if we're saying in 10 and 15 years' time, how they earn is going to be completely different from what it is today, neither of those attractive. How's a bank going to make money in 10 or 15 years' time? The same way they do today, by ripping you off on fees. <laughs> hey, it's worked for the last 200 years, it's going to work for the next 200 years. And they're going to get a little more crafty in how they rip you on fees, but trust me, broadly, same process. Boring is lacquer. I hate cyclical sectors. I don't want to, I, and I, I hate cyclical sectors because it's like I have got the scar. Cyclical construction. Because what happens? We forget to sell in the boom, and then we go crazy and buy in the bust, and the boom takes. Ah, uh, no, no. I don't want cyclical. I want companies that just swim and make money. That's why your your SAB. Huh? Times are good. What do you do? You drink. Times are bad? Man, you drink more. <laughs> so I stay far away from cyclical. M&A, mergers and acquisitions, scare the beheckness out of me. Two of my companies that I currently own are both currently doing M&A activities. Clover is buying Danone or bits of Danone. Is it Danone? No. Oh. Who? Um, Dairy, Dairy Bell. Buying the yogurt and the HT milk from there. And Woolies is going to buy some... Davy Jones crocodile thing in Australia. And why do they scare me? One simple reason. Two simple reasons. There has not been a merger that I have seen or an acquisition that I have ever seen which was done on time or at the right price. Tiger Brands just wrote down how many hundreds of millions of US dollars on their little venture into Dangote flour in Central Africa. And the first trick is, if you are negotiating with the richest man in Africa, you're probably going to lose. 
Because you know what? He's not the richest man in Africa because he got lucky. He got, he's the richest man in Africa because he out-negotiated everybody else he negotiated with. You're going to overpay for the asset. You're going to find things you never expected. It's going to take longer than you thought. The best thing that ever happened to Billiton, they tried to buy Rio Tinto at the top of market in 2007. Was it Rio they tried to buy? I think it was. The point is, it got rejected. Man, thank goodness for that. Mergers, you overpay, the synergies are not there, and the classic example we're witnessing right now, apart from Tiger Brands, MassMart. Walmart paid a humonga amount of money for 51% of MassMart, and so far we have seen zero from it. And when management says it will take three years, expect it to take five. I interviewed Ian Moore in Moore Woolies um, when the David Jones deal came out, and he's talking about earnings accretive in 20. I think he said 17. And I said to him, firstly, accretive is not like a massive word. I want like earnings boosting. Boosting is nice. Accretive says like, you know, two, three cents. And I said to him, you're, you're giving me the state. What is your confidence on actually doing that date? And of course, he spins the line, oh, we're confident, absolutely, and I drill him on it, and I drill him on it. And eventually he agrees. He says, yeah, look, you know what, these type of deals, there's a 50-50 chance you will get to the point in time at the time you said you would. And I think 50-50 is generous. And then if you pay for it using shares, I hate it even more. Because if you pay for it using shares, you're not paying today's price for the company. You're paying your future share price. So Warren Buffett did a deal, and he paid $10 billion in shares for that deal. Not just with cash. Today, that 10 billion shares is actually worth 18 billion, which meant technically he paid 18 billion for the business. You give shares away, you're giving a slice of your profit forever. You go borrow money from the bank, you pay it back to the bank, and deal now. So I hate equity, I hate mergers and acquisitions overall. And I get it, you need to grow by acquisition. And I'm not convinced by that. I mean, ShopRite did incredibly well. Coca-Cola didn't go around the world buying Coca-Cola companies. So m is to scare me even more. And it comes to the Woolies point, and I know, I know what I'm doing. I'm doing nothing. I'm not selling my Woolies. If they do a rights issue, I will probably sell my NPLs. And I might, I'm giving Ian Moore the benefit of the doubt for now, but it, it, it speaks me because I know we're going to get the right down. As sure as I'm standing here, at some point, Ian Moore is going to stand up as the CEO of Woolies and say, who, guess what, we overpaid. Man, I could tell him that today for free. It can take him three years to tell me that back. So quickly, let's run through some hard examples. Um, Please, I do not own Kumba Iron Ore. Threat of new entrance to MTN? Zero. Uh, if anything, the threat is that Sol C and ATA Telcom will disappear. And that will be, I mean, the government will hate that and then will reissue the licenses. But you've got a massively competitive space. Sorry, what is the role of MTN by There have been circling. I, I mean, a short answer is I don't think Competition Commission would allow it. Um, if anything, I think a third player, international player, might buy, um, might take ATA. Maybe. Yeah. And the Vodacom, the so Vodacom buying Neutel, if that passes, clever for them, um, gives them extra space. But Vodacom, I mean, Vodacom MTN, broadly the same, massively different. Because of the majority shareholder of Vodafone, Vodacom is restricted by the countries it can go into. So basically, it's got South Africa. Yeah, I mean, it can go to Lesotho. Mm. I've been to Lesotho. I met all seven Lesothoans. <laughs> and I take that back. If you're from Lesotho, it's a lovely country. Uh, 22 countries. And frankly, I hope they stop moving because if they carry on moving, it, uh, all sorts of issues come into it. But what we have, threat of new entrants? No. Threat of substitutes? Beyond an innovation, I can't comprehend. And that doesn't mean it isn't there. Turkso? Yeah. 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 
I get, I get to that. That's my legislative risk. Bargaining power of customers? Absolute. We have total bargaining power. And that we can go wherever we want. But at the end of the day, the churn broadly is net neutral. MTN gains, Vodacom loses, MTN loses, Vodacom gains, unless you really mess it up. And MTN did mess it up for a while. They were slow to cut their prices. But the beauty of what MTN is going to do, because they're in 22 countries, and their 22 countries are at all different stages of development, the lessons they learn in one country, they're going to start replicating out. So what's happening in South Africa will start happening in Nigeria. And when it does, they'll phone the Oaks in South Africa and say, so what worked and what didn't? And when the same issues start happening in Iran, they'll phone the Oaks in Nigeria and South Africa and say, what did work, what didn't work? So make, but no, make no mistake, there is a, 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 a threat of substitute, there is a bargaining power, sorry, bargaining power of, of customers. Bargaining power of suppliers, no. Intensity of competition rivalry, massive. You do, you do. I mean, why do you want to go and set up a cell phone company and then have to cut your rate from what used to be three rand a minute now down to 60 odd cents a minute? Data. I used to pay two rand a meg. Now I think I pay 80 bucks a gig. So quantity up a thousand, price up 40. I'm 50 times ahead of the curve, and that's only going down and down. My phone bill this month is lower than it was in 1994. My, I got my first cell phone, as I said, in, in May of 94. And I've got that, I went and found the bill. And it was 890 rand. And my cell phone, you know, and that was money back then, hey, 890 bucks, we 20 years ago. Still is. Still is. <laughs> but my bill this month will only be 600. How much data did I use back in 94? Zero. How much data do I use now? Three gig a month. So it is there. Legislative risk? Yeah, there is legislative risk. So Nigeria, MTN was banned from selling new SIMs for a month because of quality of network. ICASA comes along and says mobile termination rates, we're going to make it asymmetrical. You big oaks will pay more and you small oaks will pay less. There is legislative risk. The government could decide that they want to bring in, uh, uh, so let's say Salsi and Telcom both hit the wall, so we're back to Vodacom and MTN, and the government could say, we want to bring a third new network operator in, and we're going to make, you know, we're going to tilt the table. Yes, there is legislative risk. That legislative risk, again, will run through the different countries, and that's what I like about MTN, because the legislative risk in South Africa right now is huge. In Nigeria, it's modest. In Sudan, it's not there. And it's going to work its way through their system. They've got issues around Iran. They've got issues around Turkcell. So there certainly is some legislative risk there. The, the Turkcell one, I, I'm just ignoring because I don't know enough. I mean, basically, two people know. And a court will ultimately decide. Perhaps a court will decide. Turkcell keep on getting thrown out of court. Iran's an issue, sanctions, etc. that will unravel itself. Iran is not going to be a, a sanctioned state forever. It might be for the rest of my life. But you know, again, it comes back to they've got 22 countries. Issues in Iran are not the end of the world. And if it becomes seriously problematic, you sell Iran. So it's a good company. It, 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 and the point with this, it doesn't come and tick every box. But it ticks enough, and those it doesn't tick, I'm comfortable with. We had a Kumba iron ore. Threat of new entrants. Mine, Norka. Everyone's an iron ore miner these days. Why? Because iron ore used to be $50 a ton for like a million years. And then it went to $140 a ton. Suddenly, everyone's mining iron ore. You know, iron ore is like the most common element. You go outside into your garden tonight, you scratch the ground, you'll probably find iron ore. Not in a concentrate which you can mine it, so don't start getting mining licenses. <laughs> so what have we got? The problem with iron ore right now, we, apart from the weak demand, forget the weak demand, we've got an oversupply. And the oversupply is only starting. I mean, Minas Rios, uh, Anglo American, a couple uh, iron ore mine hasn't even opened up yet. So, broadly, no. Iron ore, no. Steel, you're going to need it. Bargaining power of customers, 
Well, actually, the customers don't have bargaining power. They have much worse. They set the price. I, Kumbaya Iron Ore is a price taker. The price of iron ore is set in an exchange, and they have nothing to do with it. So they have zero power. Bargaining power of suppliers, I would say huge. If your suppliers are the government to give you mineral rights, ESCOM to give you power, Transnet to give you railway lines, um, labor to give you workforce. I'd say Kumba have, I mean, they, they, the suppliers own them. Kumba iron ore is one of the cheapest iron ore miners in the world, and what I mean by cheapest in terms of cost curve. For them to get a ton of iron ore, they, they're like in the bottom 10th percentile. They do it cheaper than 90% of other companies. That changes because, of course, when you're a miner, you strip the cheap stuff first and the better quality and the strip ratios are declining. A strip ratio, grams of iron ore per ton milled. And that number went up 40%. Well, went down. The amount of iron ore coming out went down 40% in the last set of numbers. Kumba is still going to make a huge amount of profit. So it's going to be a less huge amount of profit. Their operating margin in 2007 was 74%. Man, that's insane. And if that half to 37%, it's still a giant number, but it's half. Legislative risk? Sure. Mining charters, BEE, nationalization. I mean, in theory, they've got their BEE partners. In theory, the mining charter is in place and Kumba has applied. And the African National Congress, as our government, has voted at uh, NEC and at Congress level against nationalization. But when I said legislative risk, every single person in this room had at least two or three ideas about what could be a legislative risk. So does Kumba meet requirement? No. Would I buy Kumba? Yes. If the iron ore price is going through the roof and demand is, is, is surging and supply is struggling to keep up, then I buy it and when the bubble bursts, I get the heck out of Dodge. Does that go into a Destro's part portfolio? No chance. 8% dividend yield? Lovely. Not interested. Six times price earnings ratio, lovely, not interested. Even at a hundred bucks, wouldn't buy Kumba. Doesn't meet my requirement. Willie's threat of new entrance? No. I mean, yes, I know Zara came. I don't know who Zara is, but she's from Spain and she sells clothes, I think. Maybe she's from Portugal. Ah, she's from Europe. And everyone gets terribly excited about Zara. One Zara store. One. Yeah, okay, they're opening a second at the VNA. Willie's has how many stores? 648. Okay, and five of them are within five minutes of me. I get it. That, that's just maybe they follow me around or something. The point being is do we see a company coming in and dropping 600 stores in South Africa to compete with Willie's? No. Improbable. Yeah. Not impossible, but highly improbable. Threat of substitutes? Sure. Giving another company 50 years to get the brand trust that Willie's has? And yes, I can buy a pair of jeans from 100 places. I can buy a, a steak. But the convenience, the brand power, and I love it when I flash my Willie's rewards card. I'm sure I'm scoring. Actually, I know I'm not, but I pretend I am. Bargaining power of customers, I can leave. That's my power. But it's the aspirational. My housekeeper, who, who, who I mean, a lovely lady and earns a, a, a decent salary, but should not be shopping at Woolies because she's not, you know, I mean, Woolies, in the classic sense, is, 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 for, is for rich people. My housekeeper has many things. She's not rich. She shops at Woolies. I ask her why. She likes the bag. I said to her, well, here's the thing, dear. I shop at Willie's, so I, I'm not joking with her, and I'm, I'm not dissing my housekeeper. She's an amazing woman. But I said to her, so here's the thing. I shop at Willie's. Why don't you just take my Willie's bags? She says, thank you. She does. So now she sometimes shops at ShopRite with her Willie's packet. But in her heart, she... 
Yes, so her friend thinks she was at Woolies, but she knows actually she was at ShopRite, and that ShopRite is not really Woolies. Man, at that point, I wanted to go buy more shares. Bargaining power suppliers, zero. Suppliers have zero bargaining power here. Intensity of competitive rivalry, massive. And we love that. Okay, in the, in the clothing space, we've got the Fashinis, the Mr. Prices, the Ed Cons. In the food space, and they're on different levels. I mean, in the food space, we've got the shop rights and the pick and pays and the, the spas. And they're all at different stratas in the market. But this is a hugely competitive market. And Walmart comes along and says, yeah, yeah, we'll show these folks how to do it. My best quote of all time. I asked Whitey Bisson, CEO of ShopRite, and I said to him, are you worried about the, the threat of Walmart? Do you think they could teach South African retailers some lessons? And his answer was, no, no, we will teach them some lessons. So far, Whitey, one, Walmart, zero. The retailer with the biggest return on equity in the world Mr. Price, the retailer with the second biggest return on equity in the world, Woolies. Yeah. Walmart's return on equity, 16%. Woolies, 52%. ShopRite, good question. I don't know. <laughs> um, man, you mustn't take me. I got some figures, not all of them. I'm trying to impress you, Oaks, with my knowledge. Um, and then I, oh, there, are, there are three global retailer awards. And these are global awards. They're big, prestigious things. Over the last decade, there have been 30 of these given out. Each one gives one a year, so three of them, 30. South African retailers, one, 17 of the 30. Why come here? No, no. Go somewhere where it's easy. London, New York. According to Woolies, Australia. Not sure. Legislative risk? Nah. The like, I get it in terms of, of local, you know, clothes, but, but not a, a massive issue. I'm running on time, I'm going to come back to that, but back to what I said at the beginning process. Keep your process diligent, notes, and process is about keeping notes. I know why I sold my SABs, I know why, why I bought it. I went on a hike in the Transkei after four days. I hadn't seen a living soul except the guy I'm hiking with. I go up the hill. There's a hut. The guy comes out. He says to me, do you want to buy a black label? There's a Shabin in the middle of nowhere. I haven't got cash, so we trade sugar for black label. The beer was warm. It's black label. I don't like it. But it occurred to me their distribution was humongous. I know why I bought it. I also know why I sold it. I was right to buy it. I was wrong to sell it. Sometimes we get it wrong. Make those notes. Build yourself that preponderance of evidence. Most stocks will fail to meet the criteria. That's fine. Walk away. What do we typically do? We're looking for reasons to buy. No, no. Look for reasons to not buy. You want to reject more stocks than you do. You want to do homework on 20 and decide on one. Because if you're deciding on one, that is, that is the winner. That is, if, you, if you do homework on 20 and you buy 12, in truth, you're lazy. Go buy an ETF. Nothing wrong with an ETF, but go buy an ETF. You want to be rejecting more because then you know you've got rigorous process. Hello Giosi says of the 400 stocks on the JSC, there are 71 that he considers investable. 71. Winning stocks and winning sectors. I say this always. Buy the winner. If there is a, a rugby match going on and the Sharks are winning by 50 points and we stop the clock with a minute to go and I say place your bets. Do you place your bet in the team that's getting pummeled? No. You place your bet in the Sharks every time. You bet on the winners. Why? Because they typically keep on winning. They dominate. They use their dominance against competitors. They use it to their advantage. The guys who are losing, can they become winners? Yes. Do they become winners? No. Those of you who were at the, at the Super Final against the Blue Bulls in 2007, Sharks are winning the entire game. Injury time, Butch James kicks down field, the Bulls win. Yeah, it happened. I was there, I saw it, I cried. That is not the common occurrence. The common occurrence is a team who's winning the whole game and after 80 minutes is still winning, they usually win. Bet on that.
Uh, no, some stocks are expensive. So here what we've done for this evening, and I'm cognizant I've run my time, so I'm trying to talk fast. Here what we've done this evening is say, okay, here's the deal. This is how we find the, co the companies we want to buy. That doesn't mean we go and buy them. Now we have to decide at what price we wish to buy them. Part two of the equation. I use simple stuff. Uh, there's that link. Is it coming there? No, it's right over back there. The, the, that thing. That's an explanation, a presentation I did uh, here last year in Durban um, where I talk about how I decide on, 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 okay, now I've identified the stock. And the stocks that are currently in my portfolio that I've been adding to because I think they meet my cheap requirement have been Capitec, has been MT, and has been... Woolies, like it, expensive. ShopRite, like it, expensive. British American Tobacco, like it, expensive. I don't buy expensive shares. I buy quality when it's cheap. This evening's about finding the quality. That is about finding the cheap. You never find the perfect stock. You find the preponderance of evidence. You never know. And, and sometimes you get it wrong. I get that. that, you know, that that's going to happen. Make no mistake, it's going to happen. Wait for that price. Investing is about patience. It's about saying, I really like this company. Now I have to wait for a price that I like. When I'm on Stockwatch, how many times do I turn to whoever my guest is and I say, do you like it? And the answer is, I like it, but I won't buy it. Great company, bad price. The price that you pay is the single biggest determiner of your ultimate value that you make. A stock makes you money in three ways. The earnings go up. The valuation goes up. So you go from a 10 PE to a 20 PE. And then dividends. If you're buying on the 20 PE, that's an example. Stocks, PEs are stock dependent. If you're buying on a 20 PE, you've lost one of your three profit legs down to only earnings and cash. Not the worst thing in the world, but why take two legs when if you were patient you could take three? The price that you pay is critical. You identify the stock, you decide the price. I, I will buy Woolies at 61. And that number changes as earnings change and, and things. Right now, if you said to me, I'll sell you Woolies shares at 61, cool, deal, I'll buy them. The market, however, is saying 78. I'm not going to be crazy, 78. 